All I ask is that you do not take what I say personally. I get more comments from older videos regarding salvation. And if someone's going to say in a comment, that I'm going to show you that salvation or in particular, one saved, always saved is my favorite topic. Well, my favorite topic is salvation. Why? Because that's literally the point and purpose of the Bible. That's the greatest thing that we can hang our hat on. It's one thing that we are grateful for. We're not grateful for money in the account. We're not grateful for good health. If all we're going to do with that is then take it to hell. No, we are grateful that we have salvation in Christ. And in that, the Bible is clear that our salvation is eternal and we have it right now lasting. And so that being stated, this person left a comment on another video that I called that I entitled unbiblical and everything in the video was dealing about things that people believe state or say that is unbiblical, meaning it is not in the Bible. And one of the things that we talk about or that people talk about a lot is loss of salvation. And the definition of something being unbiblical is that it's not in the Bible. So if there's no example of it in the Bible, then guess what? By definition, it is unbiblical. And so what example do we cite a lot that's not in the Bible? There's no examples of it. There's no there's no stories of it. That is someone losing their salvation. And so this person says that Corey has Dr. Brown on the list, a man that thoroughly cleaned his cloth. Facts, in my opinion, on what seems to be Corey's favorite subject, once saved, always saved. Yes, why isn't salvation your favorite subject? It ought to be, but his his belief is that Dr. Brown cleaned my clock. We had a, a formal debate. Now, in terms of holding on to the rules, he did. He, he knows the rules of formal debates far better than I do, and I'll never want to do a formal debate again, not because of what happened, because I don't think that he made a point, not one, but you don't get a chance to actually bring out or flesh out your points that you're trying to make. I would much rather have a conversation. And even the conversation we had about tongues, we were only limited to an hour. I want to have a conversation where there's at least two hours and we can kind of go through things at our own pace and not rush through things. But that's another story for another time. He says, Corey was essentially left dealing with one passage in John while Dr. Brown provided a myriad of scriptures. He covered a lot of scriptures. I did too. Now, I didn't introduce, I did not introduce my scriptures early on because again I didn't I wasn't familiar with the rules my mistake nobody's fault but mine however this one passage which I did more than one passage but this one passage is one of the one passages that I bring up and there is a reason for that one passage but as he says since only one passage is needed to hold to a doctrine Corey how about 1 Corinthians 14 39 this is about forbidden speaking tongues well have I ever forbid any forbade anyone from speaking in tongues and so I don't know the point that he's trying to make but my response was similarly along, along those lines that I ever uh, do such a thing in terms of uh, forbidden tongues or am I, have I ever said I was a cessationist. But I says, as for the debate, Brown had a better grasp on the formal debate rules, yet still couldn't answer that one verse. And we're going to look at that in a second. He says he referred me to, to two other men who also don't answer that same verse, which is true. We're going to look at that also. His response after that was... Uh, in a test of intelligence, you may have seen the common four or five items shown with the question, which of these figures or items do not belong? I don't know of any intelligent question, any any test of intelligence that says one of these things is not like the other. As a matter of fact, that reminds me of a nursery rhyme, not something having to do with intelligence, but I digress on that. He says, your thumbnail, thumbnail is either clickbait uh, because a smart Christian knows the difference or you simply rather... You're simply rather foolish. And so he uses the wrong word for your. It should be Y-O-U apostrophe R-E. You are simply rather foolish in my opinion, which is fine. You are free to state that I'm foolish in your opinion. We'll see uh, how foolish in just a little bit. Lastly, if the crux of your soteriology is hanging on one verse, rethink it. It is not hanging on one verse. But continuing. I and others were not caught up in the whole debate etiquette, <laughs> rather the substance. Have a good day, brother. So let's deal with this. Again, every person on the list, and if you go back and watch the video, the video was things that people believe that are unbiblical. They're all brothers and sisters in the Lord, um, or all brothers and sisters in the Lord can believe something that's not biblical and still be Christian, okay? But 
believing something that's not in the Bible is by definition unbiblical. Can this person or anyone on the planet ever cite a case in the Bible where someone had salvation, someone had the Holy Spirit in them, and then lost that salvation? No. So by definition, it is unbiblical. Now, that being the case, I want to go and look at a couple of other things. I want to look at uh, one. There was a, I had a conversation with a person who has, uh, has challenged me uh, on the topic of once saved, always saved. And in the conversation, I have cited a rule. So before I even go to that, let's go to the one verse that people uh, think that that's my only verse, but let's go to that verse anyway. That is John 10, 28. And in that it says, and I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. The purpose for me citing that is because one, if there's ever an example where Jesus or someone in the Bible said that it is literally impossible for you to lose your salvation, then we should cite it. Is it possible that someone could say in the Greek, it's impossible to lose your salvation? Is that possible? Well, sure. Just like you can say in English, it's impossible to lose your salvation. You can also say it in the Greek, meaning we've got such an example. As a matter of fact, we've got quite a few examples of that. We have what's called an emphatic negation of either a subjunctive or a future active indicative. A subjunctive, just really briefly, is words that convey potential, might, may. And so if you have a double negation, it negates the potential of it happening. And so if I say that it is literally impossible, there is literally no potential of you ever perishing. If I say that in the Greek, then that's exactly what Jesus says, and that's exactly what it means. Or if I say with a double negation in front of a future active indicative, meaning something will happen in the future, but if I give a double negation, then I'm saying that it is literally impossible. It will never, ever, ever, ever happen, not even in the future. Both of these double negations, in fact, negations negate the possibility of something happening both now or in the future, whether it be a subjunction or a future active, indic in future active indicative being negated. Both of those do the same thing. And we're going to look at both of those. The reason why I bring up John 10, 28 is because at present I have not found one Greek scholar. And when I say Greek scholar, not a person that graduated that took Greek. No, someone who is a Greek grammarian, someone that studies the Greek text, someone maybe on a translation committee, somebody. Are there people who are scholars who disagree with one saved, always saved? Sure. But can they answer this question? I have not found one. And if there is one, I just want someone to point me to one and I want to see their response. Dr. Brown brings up two people's names and we'll see if they actually covered. They do not. But I had a conversation with a person um, who's got a another channel. He goes by the name of, of Mauler. He was on and we had the conversation and I was talking to him about the rule. The challenge was, can anyone refute my exegesis, my exegesis of the Greek text? Here it is in the Greek. It says, notice what it says. And I give to them life eternal. That's clause A. Clause B, kai u me apolontai, and they will never perish. That's clause B. Clause C, and says, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. We're going to come back to that clause C as well, but we are not going to have a passage where clause A contradicts clause B, clause B contradicts clause C. That would be kind of strange if any one of those clauses contradicts the other. So even in the English, if we look at it, I give them eternal life. Well, if a person could ever perish, if a person could ever walk away, well, then that would negate, that would contradict clause A, that I give them eternal life. Certainly clause B, that they will never perish if a person could walk away. This is literally what Jesus is saying. They can never walk away. There's more to it, to that. And there's a reason why he brings in clause C and no one could ever snatch them out of my hand, which is why it says the father who has given them to me is greater to all. But notice what he says in the Greek and my interpretation, my exegesis of the Greek. But because I'm not a Greek scholar, does that mean, does that negate the fact that I can read the Greek, understand the rules, apply the rules properly? Does not at all. As a matter of fact, I know for a fact that I am doing this properly. As you look at any Greek text, as you look at any Greek grammar, be it intermediate or advanced, uh, a beginning Greek Bible study, you can't find anyone that negates. As a matter of fact, they all always seem, as far as I can find, affirm what I'm saying. I didn't invent the rule. And the rule is not only applied to this, it's applied to other areas. When Jesus says that, uh, not one jot or tittle shall pass away. 
uh, before heaven and earth pass away, that particular passage Jesus makes, he uses this emphatic negation, meaning that it is literally impossible for heaven and earth to pass away before his words be fulfilled. So it's not just used here. And if you take that same rule implied, we know it's impossible for it to happen. Similarly here, we have what's called a double negation of a subjunctive. When you have the ooh, which is no, not, never, may, same thing. Those two words before this subjunctive, which is to perish or may perish. Uh, in this in this case, apolontai means may perish. It says no, not ever, 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 surely not ever, never, ever perish. And I was extra emphatic with that because that's literally what it says. Jesus is making the statement that... Uh, perishing in the future is literally an impossibility. He says that there is no possibility of them perishing in the future. And he, and we reference uh, Daniel Wallace, one of the preeminent Greek scholars on the planet, one of the preeminent Greek textual critics, textualists. Uh, we reference him because in his book, Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics, he references this rule. Other folks reference this rule as well, other uh, Greek scholars as well. And what is being negatized is the possibility of perishing in the future. In other words, nothing in the future, according to, according to how this rule is used, shows that a person can perish. So when I had this conversation with this person, Mahler, listen to what he says. I think okay. it's, it's an improper use of that, that, that rule. That's it. And, and all, all I'm saying is, all I'm saying is this. If, if, if you're going to say that it's an improper use of the rule and you don't know the rule, that how do you make that statement? And I, I do know. Now, I'll, re I'll replay that again. But he had no idea what the rule is. I read the rule. He misunderstood the rule. I showed him the rule even more so and went further into the rule. And and so he's getting an understanding of the rule. He doesn't know Greek. And it's not a knock against him, but he doesn't know Greek. Certainly doesn't know the rule. And so I'm explaining to the, him to the rule for the first time him hearing the rule. He tells me that I am misapplying the rule. Yeah, the rule that he's never heard of before, the rule that he didn't know of before, as well as to say that uh, Daniel Wallace, Dr. Daniel Wallace also is misapplying the rule. So let me go. I want to go ahead and put it back on the screen and let me rewind this. No, the rule you educated me on it, and I, I okay. think it's it's an improper use of that 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 rule. That's it. And, and all, all I'm saying is, all I'm saying is this: if 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 you're going to say that it's an improper use of the rule, and you don't know the rule, that how do you make that statement? And I do know the rule. You educated me on it, and I could see that you're improperly using it because that's what I thought before. And now today, I've confirmed I don't agree with your use of the rule. Okay. Nor Daniel Wallace said that that's his commentary that he comes to the conclusion. Absolutely not. And now that I know that he is what Osas, I'm really going to be skeptical. I'll take it. But I'm also going to find others. And when I find others, they're going to say, no, I can't say that it says that. Now, a couple of things. First of all, it's the height of arrogance. It's actually, it, let's just be honest. It's foolish to state that the doctor, the, the scholar, the actual scholar, not me. For, because also, it would be foolish to see, even say that this guy who knows Greek, who just told you about the rule, who educated you about the rule, which he also said you just educate, educated me about the rule, to come back and say that you don't know the rule. You you misapplied, you misused the rule. And then to say that Daniel Wallace has also misapplied the rule. Can we find a scholar, one scholar, one Greek grammarian who will say, no, Daniel Wallace has misapplied this rule? Can we find one that says in any of the other Greek grammars, intermediate or advanced or even basic beginners, that will say that that is an improper use of this text of this grammatical rule. You see people like the Bill Mounts or his, or Robert Robert Mounts. You've seen the Buis Fanis. You've seen the uh, other people who have stated the same thing. This is a proper use of the rule. This is what the rule is referring to. This is how you use it. And so to come back and say that, no, I didn't know the rule. You educated me on the rule. And now that you did, I see that you're misusing it. No, that's just at the, that is silliness uh, at, at a highest level. That's what it really is, is arrogance. It's a, an unwillingness to see that you might be wrong. And someone can say that, Corey, you're unwilling to see that you're wrong. But remember, I used to believe the exact same thing. As stubborn as I was and maybe still am, I was not willing to bend. But in the face of the scriptures and in the face of the rule, what am I going to do? Say that they're wrong? Why? I have no basis to state that I am or that they are wrong or and I am right. Again, so that is the problem. But then going back to the comment that the other person had about Dr. Wallace, I'm sorry, not Dr. Wallace, but Dr. Brown, uh, he states that that 
that one verse, that one passage. And so when I had the debate with Dr. Brown, I want you guys to hear how he responded to what I said. Do you interpret John 10, 28, the Greek of John 10, 28, to mean that a person can not, or I mean that the person can, in fact, perish? If so, why would you do so? Now, the question was, do you interpret John 10, 28 to, to mean or to show that a person could perish? Let's put the past on the screen. And they will never perish, clause B. So the question is, do you interpret that to mean that they could perish? When it literally says, even in English, they will never perish. But you interpret that. There's a way to interpret that to mean that you could perish. Okay, let's listen to his response. Uh, be because uh, John 10, 27 identifies the sheep as those who in an ongoing way uh, listen to his voice and follow him. So you can be a sheep, and then you can cease to be a sheep. Those who are his sheep, and this is a constant theme, you know, the same in John 6, 37 to 40. Now, a couple of things. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that if anything, there's no condition placed on that. However, even if we take that, I don't have a problem with you putting a condition in there. By the way, go find that condition. Go find a, a, uh, a word or a phrase, a clause that is conditional. But if John 10, 27 is to be taken, if you are my sheep, uh, does it ever say that you will stop being sheep? Show the passage. Speaking of unbiblical, show a passage in the Bible that says a person will ever stop being a sheep. In verse 27, it says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. What is it saying? This is telling them what sheep do. Sheep hear his voice. This is in the indicative. So it's saying what sheep are doing. It's not a condition. It doesn't say that, it's, that sheep, if the sheep keep hearing my voice, that's not what it says, dear Dr. Brown, and he should know better. It does not say if they keep hearing my voice and if I keep knowing them and if they keep following me, that is not what it says in anywhere in John 10 or uh, as it relates to this issue, we don't find that. So you cannot say that that's what John 10, 27 is saying. It says that it, he's really stating what his sheep do. We'll come back to more of John 10 in just a second. But uh, again, what does verse 10, 28 say? Uh, the tendency of them, because they cannot get past 1028, is to say, well, uh, the reason why John 1028 doesn't say what it, what it looks like it says is because you got to really understand what's being stated in 27, what we do, as well as all of John 10. 44. Speaking of those who continue in the faith, those who persevere in the faith. But then the Greek of this, such as Dr. Stevens, Dr. Mounds, Dr. Fanning, or Dr. Wallace, and, and they will tell you, that implicit in this double negation, this emphatic negation of the subjunctive, means that the sheep cannot stop following. The sheep cannot walk away. The sheep cannot stop being sheep because of this ume apolontai. How does a person get around this grammatical construction of the Greek and say that now all of a sudden the Greek rules don't matter? Well, that's, that's the interpretation of some scholars. Surely you know other scholars. I would hope you've researched enough now, he says, surely other scholars would disagree. Let me have one. Let me have one that not, not just people that understand Greek that disagree. I want a, an actual Greek grammarian. But they don't deal with the text. And that's the problem that I have, including those that he points me to. That you know other scholars who don't read it like that. I you haven't found one the Greek, text to say that. But I haven't uh, found check one out Greek. Professor Robert Gagnon. Start there. Okay, did, Professor did, did, Robert did, did, did Gagnon and what he has to say about once saved, always saved. He's a highly, highly respected Greek I, and New Testament and I, scholar. I, I've heard other scholars say so, but I've never heard, and, I, and I'm still waiting, for one Greek scholar or one Greek grammarian to refute what I'm saying in John 10. Now, it's not me saying it, but what yeah, John... Corey, Corey, I'm, I'm, I'm answering you. There are other Greek scholars who differ. But, but they're not, not here. Greek scholar, so I'm a Hebrew here. scholar, but there are other Greek... You're not a Greek scholar either, so you're relying on these others. Okay, so a couple of things. One, you didn't answer the question. All he did was deflect and say, go look at someone else, what they have to say. And you're not a Greek scholar either. Okay, fine. We don't have a Greek scholar. So does that mean we have to wait to interpret this passage when we get a Greek scholar? And oh, by the way, let's go to one of the ones he spoke of, Robert Gagnon, who he put as a Greek scholar. He's not a Greek scholar. He knows Greek. His 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 area of expertise is, I don't think it's the Greek. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in looking at his uh, bona fides, it didn't seem like it is, but Here's his response to John 10, 28. Umi plus the subjunctive and emphatic negation. Uh, he says, surely indeed not, but that says nothing about 
once saved, always saved. The key question is, who are the sheep? Verse 27 is clear. Verse 28 does not apply to those who stop following Jesus. So notice what, notice what he's saying. He's saying the key question is, who are the sheep? Well, that's never really been the issue. We know who the sheep are. Jesus is describing the sheep. And so what, is, what does he do? What everyone else who cannot deal with 1028, they say, well, you've got to understand everything else first, which we do. But he's making as though that 1027 is a conditional, that if you keep following if you keep hearing, it says the key questions, who are the sheep? 27 is clear. Verse 28 does not apply to those who stop following Jesus because we never state that sheep will ever stop following Jesus. As a matter of fact, John 10 earlier tells us that sheep do not stop following him. They'll keep following him. And he says all New Testament authors and Jesus presume that it is possible for genuine believers to fall away or at least want their audience to believe or think that. Where do we find that in the scriptures? Give one example of someone ever falling away. Give one example of someone who was a believer who stopped being a believer. You cannot. That's the problem because you have pigeonholed yourself into an argument that you can lose your salvation, which by the way, to me, this is just me, is the height of arrogance. This is you having something to boast about, that you are the one that's keeping yourself safe because you understand the rules that God has laid out because you love him so much because you just don't want to sin that you have kept yourself from falling away. You can't keep yourself. That's the great lesson that we've learned from thousands of years of biblical history from Genesis up to the cross. You can't keep yourself from sinning. That's why Jesus says, that's why the words, I'm sorry, Paul says in Romans that there are none good, not anyone. No one is righteous. No one is seeking after him. That's the whole point. And so let's go to John 10, because again, this one scripture that the person brings up says that it's the only one. First of all, it's not the one scripture, but can we find somebody? And I might bother somebody on this, but if you're going to say that it's the one scripture, we'll find some one person who is going to refute this one scripture, whether it's uh, Gagnon, whether it's Robert Shea that he brings up, none of them deal with 1028. They're saying that a person has to keep being a sheep. Where is that in John 10? So let's go to John 10 and let's start in verse four. And you find someone, I will, listen, my wife hates when I say this, but I want to say this and I want to be as clear, as concise. I want to be as bold and confident as what I'm going to say, because I want the people that disagree, who vehemently disagree, to go to this passage and show me where the if is, where the if you stop being a sheep is, if you stop following, or you must keep following, you must know implicit in John 10 is that sheep will. This is what sheep do. It's like if a fire if if a fire remains hot, well, no, that's what fire is. Fire is hot. Not that the fire has to remain hot. Sheep keep following. Sheep here, that is Jesus' sheep. So let's go to the passage, John 10, 4. Jesus says that when he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him. The sheep are following. This word, the Greek word is Akaluthe, which is that they are following the present active indicative. It may not refer to that. That's what they're going to keep doing. However, we're going to see that's actually what he's saying. Sheep are following him um, because they know his voice. So why are the sheep following him? Because they know his voice. And now verse five, you might want to add this to one of those one passages. It's not just one passage, but this is also one of my favorite passages. Why? Look what he says and notice the rule coming up here. A stranger in the English says they simply will not follow. Now, that's a nice way of putting it. A stranger, they simply will not follow. This is Jesus trying to get you to understand. What do you take away when Jesus says a stranger, they, the sheep, his sheep, simply will not follow? How do you take that to say that a stranger, they will follow? Jesus says, said they simply will not follow. Can I tell you how emphatic this is? This is one of those double negation of a future active indicative. He says a stranger, and then we have here, u me akaluthesusin. This akaluthesusin, this is a future active indicative, meaning he is negating the possible act of it happening in the future. It cannot occur anywhere in the future. The future possibility of them following a stranger is implicitly and emphatically negated by who? By Jesus. Maybe Jesus 
doesn't know the rule. Maybe the writer, John, doesn't know the rule. Maybe that's what it is. Uh, but a stranger, they simply will not follow. But coming up, a stranger, they simply will not. They will never, ever, ever follow. Who's the they? The sheep. So he's describing what sheep do. And he says a sheep, they will not ever, ever, ever follow this strange voice. But they will flee. They will flee. This is a future, a plural future middle indicative. They will flee. This is what they will do. This is what sheep will do. Jesus didn't say if they flee. No, he says they will flee. Who will flee? The sheep. Why will the sheep flee? Because hati uk oidasen, which because not, they know. They don't know the voice. They will not. So a sheep does not know the voice of Islam. A sheep does not know the voice of Hinduism, Buddhism. A sheep does not know the voice of atheism. A sheep does not know some strange voice bidding them to leave the fold. The sheep does know that. Will it, can a sheep be wavered at some point in time? Yeah, but they're his sheep. And so what will they ultimately end up doing? They'll keep following him. They may not follow in a straight line. They might follow kind of in a zag line or whatever, but they will keep following him. Why do, we, why do I say so? Because that's literally what Jesus said. Not my words, but his word. He says this, they do not know the voice of the stranger. Whatever this strange voice is going to be, they will not know. And if anyone wants to say no, he's talking about Jewish sheep. Well, let's go to verse 14. He says, I am the good shepherd and I know my own. I know my own. There's nothing conditional about that. There's no if there. If I know my own, then my own will know me. No, I know my own. If they know me, no. He says, my own, I mean, my uh, own know me. He says, first, I know my own and my own know me. Even as the father has, um, even as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Which sheep? His sheep. He says, also, I have other sheep. Who are the other sheep? Well, obviously, this is a Gentile. So he's speaking um, about, he's talking to the Jews at this moment. He says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. He says, I must bring them also. And look what he says, they will hear my voice. So what will sheep, the Gentile sheep also do? They will hear his voice. This Greek word right here, akosusen, this is a this is future. And so they will do this in the future. Future active indicative. They will hear his voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Now, what, what's the problem with the Jews? Well, the Jews have a huge issue that Jesus brings up. He says, but you do not believe. You do not believe. Why? Because you are not. Hati uk este, because not are of the probatai. You are not my sheep. But my sheep, Jesus says, my sheep, who are his sheep that he described earlier, they hear his voice. They follow him. They won't follow any other voice. They simply will not follow, but they will run or flee from a, another strange voice. That's what Jesus says. And so he says, those very same sheep that I'm talking about, I'm giving them eternal life. And they will never, ever, ever. He said, it's literally impossible for them to perish. Is there a way to say that something is a possibility from happening in the future? There's two ways. An emphatic, a double negation, an emphatic negation, double negation of a subjunctive and of a future act of negative. We have both of those cases here in John 10, in verses 5 and in verse 28. Now, there's only three possibilities that are there for persons of salvation. That is, if God turns his back on them, they or we turn our back on him, or someone snatches us. Well, the third one is taken away because he says, "My and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them, who's the them? The sheep. His father, God, has given us to who? to Jesus. That's important. We'll deal with that in a second. He, and he is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So the third option, someone snatching us out of his hand, that can't happen. But what about the first two options that we could possibly either turn our back on him or he can turn our his back on us? Well, one of my other one favorite verses is Jeremiah 32, 39. Look what he says. And I will give them one heart and one way. And they may that they may fear me always for their own good and for the good of their own children. Look what he says. I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. 
and I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. So two things that God is stating. One, he will not, once his spirit is in us, and we'll deal with the fact that someone might bring up, he's talking about Israel. We'll deal with that. We'll see that it's not just Israel he's, he's talking to because he's also going to apply this to Gentiles. We'll deal with that in just a second. But all those whom he puts his spirit in, he says he's not going to turn his back on them and they will not turn their back on him. So one possibility is him turning his back, turning away. He says that's not going to happen. The second possibility is us with his spirit in us turning away from him. He says that's not going to happen. And then the other, the lone possibility is that neither turn their back on the other, but someone comes and snatches them away. He, Jesus already foreclosed that possibility. Now, dealing with this issue of having his spirit in us, in Ezekiel 36, 20, let's start in verse 25. He says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. This is what God said. I will do this to you. Not you doing it to yourself, but I will do this. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. Question, is it just the Jews or the Gentiles that have a new heart? Is it just the Jews or the Gentiles that has his spirit in, in us? He says, and I will put a new spirit within you and remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, which is what Jeremiah just said also. He says, I will put my spirit within you. And look what he says cause you to walk in my statutes. That kind of gets rid of the, the whole problem there of someone wanting to walk away from him, someone being involved in sin to where the sin brings them or breaks fellowship completely from God. They're going to walk in his statutes and you'll be careful to observe my ordinance. That's what's going to happen when the spirit is in us. Now, is that just for Jews or is for Jews and Gentiles? Well, in John 3, Jesus brings this exact same thing up and he says that a person must be born of those two elements that we see in Ezekiel 36 water and spirit. A person who's born again or born of the spirit, born from above or born of the spirit. And so it seems as though Jesus is speaking of just uh, the Jews and he is speaking to a Jewish person, to a Pharisee, that is Nicodemus. But he also says that we're also told that this replies to us because in John 1, 12, as a matter of fact, let's go there. But as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So those who believe in his name, as many, this word hasoi, which includes not just Jews, but Gentiles, all the folks, whoever it is that received him, he gave the right to become children of God. So he's speaking of a holistically total, in total, all of those, those who, who believe it, which is the word is the uh, pistusen, which is those that are believing. So all the ones that are believing uh, in his name. And look what he says, those who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, so they're not, it's not an ethnic born, not a because they desire to do so, nor of their own little will they're wanting to, but they were born of the will of God, born of God. That's all of us. We know so because John tells us all of us that are believing are the ones that were born of God. And going back to John 10, 28, he says, or 29, he says, my father who has given them to me is greater so that no one can snatch them out of my hand. The reason why that's important, because if we go to John 6, let's go there also. Another one of my number one favorite verses, he said, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes or the one that's coming to me, Ecumenos, the one that's coming to me will not hunger. And oh, by the way, the word that's used here is ume, a double negation, panase, which is this person will never, ever, ever, ever hunger if you come to him. Well, is it possible to hunger later after coming to him? Come to him on a Monday. What about next Friday? No, ever, ever, never, ever, ever will you hunger. And he who believes, this word is a hapistuan, that the one that's believing will never thirst. If you are believing now, you will never, ever, ever thirst. But I say to you that, that you have seen me and yet you don't believe. All the Father, all, pan, let's move this up on the Greek side so you can see, all that the Father gives to me. Jesus said in John 10, all that, let's put it back on the screen because I want you guys to, to follow along with me. He says, my father who has given them to me, given who? Sheep. The father has given the sheep to Jesus. Are you with me? So now he says, he makes a statement, I'm sorry, wrong passage, back to John 6. He says, all that the father gives, those are the very same sheep that the father has given. He says, they will come to me, which is kind of uh, indicative and emblematic and, and brings into remembrance what he says in John 10, that them coming to him, he says his sheep will follow. 
they will follow. They will simply not follow another voice. He says, all that the sheep give, I mean, the father give these sheep, all these sheep, all that he gives will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. I will certainly not cast. Here it is again, this double negation of a subjunctive, u me akbalo. So this rule is there too. Am I still misapplying the rule? No, I absolutely not. I would love for someone to say, no, Corey, you are applying this rule incorrectly. Come show us. Come demonstrate. In the Because I don't have a problem with being wrong. We want to be right. We want to follow what is right. But we're not going to follow your guess, your understanding, or your misunderstanding, or the fact that you don't know the word, or I should say don't know the rule. And because you don't know the word or don't know the Greek rule, then for some other reason, we're supposed to find. Since you don't know it, we should act as though we don't know it. That's not right. That's not, as a matter of fact, that's not very wise or smart, to borrow a pun. That's not being a smart Christian. Let's figure out what we don't know, learn it, and apply it. How about that? Notice what he says. He says, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given. Who has he given? The sheep. All that he has given me, I will lose none. I will lose none but raise him in the last day. Now, let's drop down to verse 47 and notice what he says as well. John 6, 47. He says, truly, truly, I say to you that he who believes, this is the hapistuan, so the person is believing, hapistuan, the person that's, that's believing, has eternal life. Go over to the right side, the Greek, eke, this is present tense. He has right now, the one that's believing, if you are a sheep, if you believe, then what does he say? Right now, you have Zoane Ionian, you have life forever. You have life going into the age, or actually the, the word is properly used. You have life eternal or life into the ages. So when do you have life? According to Jesus, unless Jesus doesn't know the rule, unless, just, unless, unless I'm told I'm to believe that Jesus doesn't understand how to apply this, which makes no sense. Jesus states that if you believe, if you believe, you have at this very moment, life going into the ages. Again, if a person thinks that it's biblical that a person can lose their salvation, find it in the in the Bible. Let's get out of the habit of stating something is biblical if it's not in the Bible. If you don't have an example of what you believe, then what you literally believe is unbiblical. Now, does that mean that a person is in sin, they're not saved? No. You can be wrong and it not be sin. For example, if I get a math question wrong, I'm wrong, but is that a sin? No, I'm just wrong. What would be wrong is to continue to stay in ignorance, to be willfully wrong, no matter what. I don't care what you show me, I'm not going to believe. Well, now we've we've left being wrong and jumped over into pride. But Corey, what about you? No, it's not that I'm proud. Now I'm proud of what God has done for me. In that sense, I'll boast about the salvation, how weak I am. But remember, as I said before, I used to believe and would fight people on the possibility of losing salvation. I said that you could lose it. You could always lose it. But after a while, just looking at the scriptures, I could not do anything with it. So my challenge again, and I'll keep raising this challenge because it's just that important. It is ridiculously important. It's the one thing that he's given us that we can be secure in. Even if we go to, to, to Hebrews 10, we've covered this. Even if we go to the passages where you think you can lose your salvation, Galatians 5, or Hebrews 6, which says if you do lose it, it's impossible to get it back. But those are folks who just don't simply understand what the atonement is, because that's what he's bringing up in Hebrews. Whatever passage you want to go to, we've literally covered every last passage that people thought that you, that states that you can lose your salvation. We've covered every, at least every one that's been brought up, I should say it that way. But no one has ever dealt with this one passage, other than to say where you were applying it wrong. How else could you apply it? He literally says that his sheep, the possibility of his sheep perishing will never happen. There is no possibility of sheep ever, ever, ever perishing in the future. His sheep will never, ever, 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 ever follow a strange voice. They will run away. They will flee. So now, again, one last time for the smart Christians that are out there or those that think that we're not that smart. Could you please, intellectually, run through the passages that, that I'm citing and tell me how I am misapplying the Greek to John 10, 28, as well as John 10, 5. 
as well as John 6, 37, 39, 47, as well as even, and I didn't break down the Hebrew, but just the Hebrew if you want to, of Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. Tell us where we have parsed this incorrectly, where we have executed this incorrectly, and then you'll have something. And I will apologize. I'll come before everyone and say that I'm wrong because I have no problem with that. I want to say what is right. It's not about who's right, but it's what's right. And so because of this, I think it's vitally important. Why? Because that's what God has given us. That's the gift that God has given us. Not tongues, not being slain in the spirit, uh, not money in our bank accounts, not health, not, none of those things. And some of those things might be true, might actually happen. But the whole goal is salvation. And don't you want to have salvation forever? I should hope so.